I mean, there's really two single ideas that have always sat at the center of everything I've been involved with. One is systems and complexity, and one is learning. And they're, they're kind of married very naturally because the more you understand about complexity, the more you understand there's really no option except to adopt a learning orientation. You're never going to figure it all out. That's one of the most important ideas. And all our kind of management kind of, um, I guess I would say mythos, which is so prevalent of the managers or people in control, is by it on its face, you know, contradicts the first characteristic of truly complex settings no one's in control you know who's in control of their teenagers right it's like silly as soon as we think about the family the whole idea of control seems so silly because we realize it really is a social system it's a living social system but then when we go around to our organizations we still often click into that control mindset so the learning we often position learning is kind of uh, the, the 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 alter ego you might say of to control if you if you can't really control things do you just give up no you adopt really a learning orientation you you have goals you have aspirations you have things you really want to work on you take some steps and you really learn how it's working um, along the way we had to come up with some very simple definitions the first one was what we mean by learning the word learning of course is a very common word but it actually is is understood in a very um, counterproductive way often you think often about being passive someone else the teacher's in control you're learning what the teacher wants you to learn and of course for most of us when we think schoolroom it's not very active we're not doing anything um, so what we always have to pause on a little bit in, in talking about learning is we don't mean school as the model for learning you know think about walking think about talking Think about learning to ride bicycles. Think about all the things we do when we're children very naturally because we have this deep instinct to learn. In fact, there are some who call learning the most fundamental drive of human beings. We are just predisposed. No one has to give you incentives to want to learn to talk or walk. It's in you. You see people do it, you go, I want to do that. So it's always driven by aspiration, uh, an inner sense of something that's important to you. And it always involves obviously doing, and then of course, making mistakes. And the irony of the schoolroom association is not only is it wrong, it's actually 180 degree wrong. Because a lot of what comes along with people associating learning with school is avoid making mistakes, right? Nobody wants to get that paper with the big C or D or F written in red on it because, my gosh, maybe my parents will find out. So, so it, it tends to evoke a lot of fear and avoidance of the basics of real learning, which is always driven by personal aspiration, goals, things you care about, and a certain basic knowledge that you know only one thing for sure. It won't turn out as you expected, right? <laughs> Everybody who starts to ride a bicycle, everybody knows that they're going to fall off that bicycle. They don't want to, but it's going to happen. So that kind of embracing of error and things not turning out as what you intend is integral to learning. And of course, with that has to come a certain, you might say, courage or openness. You know, if you're, if you're totally dominated by fear, you will not learn much of anything. It's one of the reasons a lot of organizations uh, really are quite, you know, contradict themselves. They say they're all about learning, but on the other hand, if you really spend time in that organization, you'd see the predominant emotion is actually fear. They're afraid of their boss, they don't want to look bad, they're afraid that they won't get promoted or whatever. And a lot of those emotions go back to school. That's what our conclusion has been over the years, when you really kind of peel the layer of the onion. How did human beings who are by their nature so predisposed to learning become so averse to learning? that has to involve very strong conditioning. And the most powerful institution in that conditioning is of course the one we all encountered as young children when we were most impressionable. I mean, I've, I've often wanted to do the study, you know, do interviews of kids at the age of four or five, and then at eight, and then at 10, and then at 12. And I'm quite sure you would track very clearly, even by the age of eight or nine, they've been in school enough that they're starting to get worried about, you know, well, how will I do on the next test? I think the largest seventh grade, um, at, at seven years of age, because third grade they get the first test. Yeah, and well, nowadays with our kind of routinized, standardized yeah. testing, you can be pretty sure we're looking. Yeah. And of course, it, and the kids, of course, are very intuitive because they're not only anxious for themselves, they pick up their teacher's anxiety. 
Because of course the teacher is very anxious. How will my students do in this test? Because if the students don't do well, I don't look good as a teacher. So kids are kind of operating in this field of anxiety and all that gets internalized. And as I said, very unfortunately, associated with the word learning. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to design a, an institution brilliantly to destroy people's love of learning, you couldn't do a better job than school, ironically. So sad. It's very sad. And the more you kind of really sit with it, you really appreciate not only the sadness for the individual children, the sadness for the society, the sadness for people's work lives, because they carry all that programming into their work life. You, you, it's really hilarious. I, 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 I figured this out years ago. If you go around the world in all kinds of different cultures where kids play video games, which is like most cultures in the world, most of the video games, a lot of them are organized in levels, right? To get to level three, you gotta get through level two and so on and so forth. And typically, particularly when they have an element of violence, which a lot of them do, you have to kill something mm. on each level to get to the next. Mm. All around the world, the kids use the same term for who they have to kill, the boss. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, the imagery is so perfect. These kids want, are, have to kill their teacher, who is their, their boss, right, in their classroom, in order to learn. And it's interesting how readily kids just gravitated to that kind of metaphor, to kill was just a monster or something. They all they call all around the world. All kinds of call the boss. You've got to kill the boss. So it's very complex matter. Is it always the case for us humans? You know, the emotional part of it is right at the heart of it. So we've internalized all these complex and contradictory emotions around learning, and then we turn around and say, "Hey, we want to be a learning organization," as if you know, it's just a matter of saying the words and like magic, it'll all happen. So this is a journey we've been on a long time, trying to understand why it's not straightforward, why it is really challenging, whether you're, you're in a university or a, a, a primary secondary school or in a, in, a, in a business organization, why just saying it isn't good enough, even if you're sincere. I mean, I've seen so many people who are super sincere, we really need to do this, they really mean it, but they just don't realize the emotional complexity of the territory they step into. So we've come up with a very simple definition of learning through all this. Learning is a process we humans, it's not just humans, but that any species goes through to develop a capacity to do something you couldn't do before. Learning is all about capacity building. It can be individual learning or it can be collective learning. Teams are great environments for collective learning, potentially. In fact, for many years I've used, again, as a typical example to get people to think about, say, well, what's a learning organization? I say, well, have you ever been on a team you thought was a great team? It could have been in sports, it could have been in dance, it could have been in a workplace, it doesn't matter. A group of people who you thought was a really extraordinary team. Oh yeah, people have always got good examples. And then I just ask, well, was the team that good when it started? Oh no, 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 we weren't nearly that good. That's called a learning organization. It's a group of people collectively who enhance their capacity to create the kind of results they really want to create. So learning is both very fundamental and, and uh, very complicated in a funny way.